All right. Welcome back to the Prolific Author Podcast. We are here today with author Richard P. Stone. How are you today, Richard? I'm doing quite well. Thank you very much. Good, good. So why don't we start out by having you introduce yourself and tell us just, you know, who you are, a little bit about you and what you write. Uh, well, you already know my name, uh, 68, retired teacher, uh, um, have dabbled in a few things, played basketball overseas for 11 years, wow. and always been a kind of a writer at heart. I used to write when I was a small kid back in the 60s. It was a spy era, so James Bond and the man from Uncle. So I wrote about us neighborhood kids being secret agents, and, <laughs> and Star Trek rolled around, and all of us were on a spaceship going through space, and then the Magnificent Seven, the Guns of Magnificent Seven came up and I started getting hooked on that. So we were all cowboys out there, you know, doing our thing. But uh, I, I've always been a writer at heart, but just never really was able to put it together. I guess the best way to say it, I wasn't mature enough to put stories together. Hmm. And uh, it wasn't until the beginning of 2000 that uh, I saw an opportunity to put a story together. And so I just put the pieces together and it's kind of unique how it all came to play because I didn't plan it this way. It just happened. Right. And uh, to tell you a story about that, I used to, I was an eighth grade science teacher and I had some uh, students and this is when Lord of the Rings was about to come out. And they were saying, like, oh man, I can't wait for that video game to come out and this and that. And I said, hold up guys, you know, they did create a game based on Lord of the Rings about 25 years ago. And I said, what's it called? And I said, well, it's called Dungeons and Dragons. Now, I wasn't an avid player, but my brother was. And they said, well, what's that? So I called my brother and I said, give me your stuff. I want to try something. So for homeroom, I'd roll them up characters and, and they would go through adventures. And these kids were just blown away. You could use your imagination mm -hmm. to have fun. So uh, we got a new principal. And the principal came in and said, I want every teacher to have a club. I said, well, I already got mine. You know, so the new assistant principal came room and says, what do you got? And I said, well, it's a role-playing game. It's thinking out of the box. It's critical thinking. It's math. It's science. It's team strategy. It's individual strategy. And they said, well, this sounds great. What's it called? I said, well, it's called Dungeons and Dragons. Uh-uh, no, 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 we can't do that. There's been too many people <laughs> killed over it. There's been Satan worshiping, da, da, da. So he says, well, take it to the principal, see if she approves it. I go to the principal. I do the whole spiel all over again. She loves it, thought it was the greatest idea, but never asked me what it was. Uh, so I had my hand on the door now, ready to leave. And I said, uh, sorry, what I got to tell you the name of it. She said, what is it? I said, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, no, 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 we can't do it. <laughs> so I said, well, I don't have anything there. She said, do you have another game that's not Dungeons and Dragons? And I just so happened that when I was playing with my brother, uh, I had bought a game that was kind of a post-apocalyptic game made by the same company. Mm. I said, well, I do have something else. She said, well, run with that. So I rolled the kids up characters and every 30 minutes, every morning we would play in homeroom and I kept notes on their characters, everything that happened that day. But so by the end of the school year, I looked down, and I said, well, I have something here. I, I got a story I can put it together. So it took about 15 years, 16 years for me to put it all together wow. eventually. But I had to go through the growing pains as a writer. Right. You know, first time I wrote it out, I had a, my best friend was a language arts teacher at the school. I say, hey, can you edit this for me? And he was one of those red, red pen teachers. And I mean, it looked like Jack the Ripper just went all over. There was red <laughs> ink all over the place. And I was I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. This is this is too much. Yeah. But uh, it's like my, my mentor says, a, a lady you will be talking to later, Don Greenfield, Ireland. She said, there's too many voices in my head. I can't stop writing them. That's basically mm -hmm. what happened. Right. So I went from writer critiques to writer critiques. Uh, I met Dawn and went into her writer's critique, which was, I mean, a godsend for me. It helped me learn about writing mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, I can't stress writer critiques enough. It, it, they're just a, a good way to learn because people, when they right. write, they hate to fail. They hate to write something that's not right. And my message to them is that you want to make those mistakes because that's how you learn to yes. become a better writer. Yes. So, um, so I got. I'm big on writer critique out. groups too. So yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So I, I pretty much, you know, Don pretty much took me under her wing and, and helped me put this book, the first book, together. Good. And um, 
And then the second book, it just came out this this, uh, this summer, which ironically, my second book is actually my first book I wrote. And my second book is actually the first book I published. <laughs> so it's kind of messed up, but it, it worked somehow. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really a, a delightful story that you you kind of totally have the origins of how it came. That's so fun. So you do have yeah. two books out now and they're both sci-fi, right? They are sci-fi post-apocalyptic. Uh, I'm finishing my third. I'm about to send that to my publisher to oh, good. let them digest it a little bit. So and I got a whole bunch of stuff written that I just got got to sit down and, and fix it up and stuff yeah. like that. Because what's interesting is when I first started writing all these stories. And then after going through a writer's critique, and then I have to come back and try to put the story together, I find all the mistakes I used to make all mm-hmm. over the place. And uh, it's very refreshing to, you know, to catch yourself in those things and kind of see your growth as a writer. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I kind of have a funny story about that. I have a dragon book that I'm working on right now. It's high fantasy. And I was writing it like four years ago and then it got backburnered for other projects. And so when I went to start on it again, I went and got those other, you know, the chapters I had written before. And I fully expected that I was just going to rewrite them. I wasn't going to use those, right. but I thought I would use them as jumping off points for the actual story bit of it. And even that I like couldn't use a single thing that I written before. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, you're right. It just shows how much you grow and how much you change as a writer, which is always a good thing, but it's kind of funny to go back and look at your early stuff. And you got to be kind of uh, honest with yourself that, you know, mm-hmm. if, I mean, too many times in writer critiques, we'd get new people in and then we would show them corrections or, you know, this needs to be like this or, you know, why are you saying this when over right. here you said this and they would defend it. No, no, no. You don't understand. That's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> and and I learned from that point and Don and Don taught me the most valuable lesson. When you're writing your story, you're writing from your heart, but you're writing to the reader. Mm-hmm. Cause if the reader can't read it, what's the point of you putting this story together? Right. Right. So, I mean, yeah. And, and the other thing is, um, I think, and it's just, like you say, it's something that comes as we grow, but even if you're, even if it's readable, you know, quote unquote readable, mm-hmm. if you're constantly pulling the reader out of the story, because you put in a line that you just wanted to be that way, it mm-hmm. actually really messes with their experience of it, you know? So you have to learn yes. to give them a very smooth and immersive experience, even if it's not exactly how you wanted to come, wanted it to come out on the well, page. A, a funny story is that, you know, in, in my first book, there's a character that uh, he's a South African spy that, you know, they got involved and he was in a crash and the only thing survived was his brain. So he had to put his brain inside a robotic body to survive and stuff like that. And originally I had it planned down the road that he is eventually going to die. He's going to be the hero that dies to save everybody. Mm-hmm. And when Don asked me, she says, well, what's going to happen to this guy? And I explained it to her. She just looked at me. She goes, can't do that. I said, what do you mean? I can't do that. It's my story. She goes, no, he's my favorite character. <laughs> you can't kill. If you kill him off, nobody wants to read your books anymore. Right. And I didn't understand what she meant by that. So I had friends that also read the book and stuff like that. And I asked them straight up, who was your favorite character? Oh, it was Marty. So now I have to rewrite the story to where he has to survive. Mm -hmm. I have to change up some parts of it, which I found out is very refreshing and challenging because now you get to use your imagination and figure out kind of how you're going to work through all this and how to make it work. So I find that kind of exhilarating, but. You know, it, it, fate has a funny way of playing with a writer. Yeah. C- can you elaborate on that more? How do you mean? Well, I'll tell you a perfect story. Um, I was, when I first started writing this story, I couldn't find anybody to edit it. I was going through writer critiques after writer critiques, and it, it just, it stalled. Mm-hmm. So I was getting to the point where I was getting frustrated. I said, you know what, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time with this story. So I got, I started a new job at a different school. And there was a librarian there that she loved to read and, and stuff like that. And I said, hey, can you edit my story for me? She goes, I'm not editing anything. I said, oh, but she said, but I will read it. I said, okay, that's fair enough. I'll, I'll take that. So I printed out three chapters, put it in a folder, stuck it on her desk. Three days passed by, I passed by her office and that folder had not moved. And I just <laughs> went, eh, nothing's going to happen. 
So after the weekend, I'm, I was athletic director and I was going to wash some uniforms. So I had to get in there early to do that. So I was one of the first people in school and my room was all the way in the back of the school. So I go all the way to my room to drop off my stuff. And there she was clutching this folder. She's going like, crap, I need more of this. I said, seriously? She goes, yes. And yeah. after that, the word just flowed through my hands as I was typing the story out. I mean, that was the push I needed. So right. I always call her my mojo. She was my <laughs> mojo. Yeah, for sure. Uh, for most writers, all you need is a little genuine encouragement that somebody likes mm -hmm. your story and it'll just start yes. to yes. flow much easier. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So you said earlier that um, you had a lot of growing pains as a writer, as we all do. So can you talk about maybe some of the fears you overcame and, and how you worked through them? Uh, well, when you're a kid writing, there is no fear. You're just writing whatever <laughs> you know, comes to mind. You know, I'm a comic yep. book freak and, and stuff like that. It wasn't until I started seriously thinking about putting this story together and uh how, you know, like I said, my best friend did the first edit and I was, I was just shocked. I just said, I, I'm out of my element. I don't know if I can do this. But, you know, a little voice says, no, look at the corrections that he made and change them and fix them up. Mm -hmm. And I listened to some of the things he said, well, I didn't like this part because you were doing too much of this. And I didn't like that part. There's some parts you did okay, but you didn't elaborate on it. Mm -hmm. So it was like a baby walking. You got to learn how to take those first steps. Right. to learn your balance and then once you get your balance then you just want to get some confidence going so uh my first writer's critique uh actually i uh, it was at a barnes and noble I, I also drew cartoons when i was a teacher i always had a comic book at the end of the year of the funny things that happened at school with the teachers in them and everybody loved the comic book so i said well maybe i should try to publish a comic book and so there was a lady that, that was doing this uh, little seminar there that I took the comics to. And I said, look, I'm trying to get published. And she says, you ever thought about writing? And I said, no, you know, I, I dabbled at it, but I'm thinking cartoons is my way. She says, come back next week and, and bring me your comics. I just want to look at it, which really was bait because she was fishing for me and knew that she was not interested in those comics. And so, uh, I went to, so we're working on writing and I'm going to give you writing prompts. Mm. So I was like, I didn't know what I was doing, but she gave me this writing prompt and I was just right away. And I just loved what I was doing. And that was kind of the key to make me realize that, you know, this is your, your, I don't know if the word talent is a word I want to use, but it, it made me feel so good that it started giving me some confidence in what I had to do and started showing me the way to go. Mm. So Going through each writer's critique I went through, the first one, we only bring six pages. And everybody, you know, you'd read it out to everybody and everybody would have their say. It took forever. And finally, Barnes right. & Noble shut us down. I went to a second writer's critique, which I was the new guy, and everybody brought a chapter. Well, after they read everybody's chapter, they didn't have any time left over. And I was the last guy on the totem pole, so I was wasting my time. Yeah. Then I went to another one that... Um, would meet at uh, Le Madeline, the French restaurant, and everybody would sit down and eat, and then they'd go over the stories. But, but these people were strange. Uh, best way I could put it, there was one lady that wanted to write songs about baseball, and then she would try to sing them. And we were like, oh, oh stop, stop right there. And finally <laughs> had to convince her, why don't you write poetry about baseball? Right. So she switched over to that, thankfully. But, uh, you know, and they were always asking, well, what happens this character down the road? And I said, well, you have to read it to find out. They were like kids wanting to know what their Christmas presents were before Christmas. <laughs> so, and it wasn't until I met Don that her, her group was so organized that we would send in 20 pages of our work online. Everybody had a chance to read it. So then when you go for the meeting, nobody reads your story. They just go down to each person and they would say certain things about your book, your, your right. pages. And at the end, they would give it to you. So I'd have a stack of like 10 people's critiques on the, mm -hmm. on the 20 pages I sent. And then I'd have a blank one that I, that I didn't mark on. And I would put everybody's critique on one uh, set. And that, I mean, right there, just, it was an education. Right. It really taught me how to, how to write. So. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you kind of went through that because I, I really encourage critique groups. And actually, we run ours a lot like that. We do ours almost fully via Zoom now. 
but mm -hmm. yeah, I think you have to, I, it never occurred to me that maybe people don't entirely know how to run a critique group. You really do have to read the chapters in advance so that everyone has mm -hmm. already read them. And then you can just right. give the critiques because it would take all the time to read them all out, you know? Yes. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really good point. And it, it is, it's just learning from other people. And, and I've seen it not only with myself and my own writing, but there are other writers, as you said, we'll get a new writer in and we'll see their first stuff. And then like a year later, you can go back and look at their first stuff and just see how much they've improved by being willing mm -hmm. to, you know, be receptive to people's, you know, teaching and people's critiques about it. So yeah, for sure. Right. That's, it's a really effective way to educate yourself as a writer about your own writing. Right. And I, and I got, and I found out another thing is I got a new computer and I got that Microsoft 365 mm -hmm. and it has read aloud button on there. Now, when I have to read the chapter, I was always taught, you know, by there was two little old ladies in our group that always took me to the woodshed every time I brought something in. I mean, they would just really give it to me hard. And one of the things they'd always say is, Re keep rereading your story over and over and over. You'll find something new to change. Mm -hmm. And so uh, on my third one, I've been, you know, reading it, reading it, reading it. And then I see this little button up there that says, read aloud. Mm -hmm. And I clicked it and it reads it back to me. And I found that so helpful because when something doesn't sound right, oh, oh wait, wait, go back. I've got to change this. Right. I'll follow the words. I'll see the punctuations are wrong. I got to correct those. So I'm finding that this has helped me as a writer, you know, as yeah. I'm also going to make myself look good to a publisher that I'm not making as many mistakes as I did before. So yeah, for it sure. Helps. And even if people don't have Microsoft 365, there's there's a lot of software online you can use now. I use, um, mm -hmm. I think it's called naturalreadervoices.com or something. And most of them have yeah. paid services you can use, but there's always a free tier, you know? And so, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I agree. I always do audio edits on my, I call them audio edits on my work because oh, sounds, yeah, perfect. so often our brains will fill in missing words or just skip over something because we've read it so many times and hearing yes. it, man, you catch so much more that you wouldn't it, have caught otherwise. And I learned that in my first book because, you know, I, I went over it so many times and then Don went over it so many times. And then I got one of the, the little old ladies that used to take to the woodshed. She she edited it, too. And then when I finally went ahead and put it to print, uh, somebody came to me and says, look, there's all these mistakes in the book. Mm -hmm. So I made the correction, send it in. So now I'm realizing it doesn't matter how many times you read it. It's like you said, your mind kind of glazes over the words. Because mm -hmm. you know the story before you're reading it, and mm -hmm. you know you have to hear it sometimes to understand yeah. what you did wrong. Well, and the other thing, I mean, it, it depends on whether you're going to end up following this path or not. But it also, by default, optimizes it for an audiobook because you already mm -hmm. know that it sounds pleasant when you're reading it. You know, there's right. so I hear yeah. so many people say, "Oh, well, you don't realize that when you're putting all these, you know, for example, dialogue tags and things that can sound really clunky in an audiobook." But if you mm -hmm. listen to it, then you know what sounds too clunky and can fix it. And automatically right. it's going to sound better in audio. So right. that's also kind of an added benefit of doing that. The only thing missing on the audio edits is the emotion added mm -hmm. to the word. You, know, <laughs> some, you just get this bland, like, you know. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it's supposed to be more than that, but, you know. Yeah. Take Thankfully, you when you get an audio narrator, they'll put a little drama and yes. emotion into put it. Put a little so. emotion into it. Yes, I agree. <laughs> So how, if you, um, if you were talking to a, you know, a new author who was kind of at the beginning, how would you tell them to overcome their fears of, of writing and, and doing this as they move forward? First thing I would tell them is that you're not the first writer in the existence of time that ever feared writing. You know, mm -hmm. we all have to get over that. I always try to stress to them the most important part of writing is you have to believe in your story. Yeah. If you believe in your story, then the, writer, the reader is going to believe in you too. So uh, it's a matter of, you know, some people had trouble with confidence. And my philosophy is, you know, you can't be confident about everything the same way. There's some things that you're strong in, you'll be confident. There's some things you're weak at, you can't be confident. Right. But I think uh, writing is a way that it's a process of confidence. You learn as you go along and as you find, cor start correcting things, your confidence gets a little bit bigger a little bit better to write. So, I mean, I always tell young writers, you know, I, especially, you know, like where I work and I used to be at Skechers and we talk about writing kids. Oh yeah, I'm writing a story. And I said, well, give it to me. I want to look at it. I'll critique it for you and stuff like that. And, you know, they're not double spacing. 
they're not, you know, it's all clumped up together. They're using all different kind of fonts and, yeah. you know, and then they're, they're kind of like reading, you know, writing their story like it's a 30 minute sitcom that you got to put all the plot in in 30 minutes and then that's it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I say, you know, kind of stretch things out a little bit. You want the reader, you know, one advice I do give kids and people, right? I always, one of the things I learned at one of the seminars is that I always put a conflict on every page. It could be a massive battle between nations. It could be having trouble with the coffee maker. It could be something that people can relate to. And that makes the reader more comfortable to read. Right. You know, it's a headache. It's a door, door not opening properly or something. Because, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes people write things that are just too perfect. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and you got to write that we live in an imperfect world. And no matter what time frame you're talking about, what, century or whatever we still have same problems now that that happened 500 years ago mm-hmm. you know about right right wearing clothes that don't fit right or you know yeah something's not in its right spot or something like that so. yeah for sure for sure that's really really great advice so are you um you said something about a publisher so are you traditionally published then I, I, well, actually, no, Don has the Artistic Origins Publishing Company, but I, I self-publish oh, through okay. Amazon and also through Smashwords. Okay. I'm trying to get some other ones, but I'm just having trouble putting my cover on there. And it's just like, it, it, it's like, why is this pulling teeth? Can not this be easy to do? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the only two ones that I found that are they were pretty easy is, of course, Amazon and also uh, Smashwords. You put in your ebook. And sometimes they have these great sales that, you know, you can put right. your book up for free for a month and people were jumping on that. So just to get my book out there. Uh, mm-hmm. Another thing I tell young writers too, is like find your, a writing competition. You never know. Cause you know, like my first writer's competition I put in uh, was the Hollywood book festival. And I got runner up in science fiction division. Hmm. And I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> you know, are you serious? You know, uh, <laughs> that actually happened but um i mean if you can get a digital badge to put on your cover even better you know make yeah. your book look better so i always try to stress to do that yeah and i think it um i mean like you say it gives you accolades behind your name that you have some mm-hmm. experience writing and know what you're doing but i think it also creates a lot of self-esteem to be able it to does. say i won this award or i am you know, whatever it is, I've hit the USA Today list or, you know, whatever it may mm-hmm. be. So, yeah, I think that's good advice um, as people go along to try and get, I mean, it's not the end all be all of all things, because usually right. those don't bring in a whole lot of money, but it does kind yeah. of help with other aspects of, of the yeah. writing journey. Well, for me, I wasn't, expe- you know, I wasn't expecting anything. I was just putting it in there. Right. And actually, I think I felt like I got the best part of it because the person that won first place they were supposed to get $1,500, but they had to travel all the way to Hollywood to attend the banquet to receive a $1,500 check. Mm. And then if I'm thinking about airfare, hotel, right. spending money, it's going to be more than $1,500. So I'll take the digital badge <laughs> and just, you know, slap it on my book and go that yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, well, you know, I really appreciate you being here today. What is your, what is your favorite part of writing now that you're a little further along and you're kind of past that first stage? What would you say is your favorite part? Uh, the challenge. I like, yeah. you know, like, like I said, a lot of my writing was based on that game that the kids played mm-hmm. and, uh, and I have to change because of copyright laws and this and that, but it adds on to my imagination that I can create something totally different. Right. something similar that's on there, but I can change it up. Like there's certain animals that, you know, I, I kind of changed an idea in my first book that basically mutations came from ancient alien DNA. And that, you know, it kind of explained mutants a little bit and stuff like right. that. that. Uh, but I mean, I, I love the challenge of writing. Um, and then I also love the challenge that, you know, some of these kids, uh, and I'm going to tell you a story about one girl that uh, she yeah. was one of the first players of that game. And she was the main female character. And she played the game better than anybody. All the boys wanted to go in shooting and doing all this stuff and end up getting killed and have to get new characters. She was always very cautious in what she did. And, and then I, at the end, I, I gave kids a little sheet like, okay, 
tell me what the experience was. You know, what did you learn from this experience and this and that? And she wrote back that I really learned that life's about rolling the dice. You never know what number is going to come up. You never know what's <laughs> your time and stuff like that. We kept in touch after she left middle school. She can't used to come back in high school after school and wanted to read what I've written so far and stuff like that, read about her character. After she finished high school, we stayed in touch. She would get in touch with me whenever she's having some adversity. You know, I'd kind of give her fatherly advice and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Whenever she wanted to brag, when she had the birth of her son, she was also happy and stuff. So when I told her this book was coming out, she was so excited and just so looking forward to the book. But unfortunately, a few months before she passed away at oh. 32 with a seven-year-old son. Oh. And um, I went to the wake and, you know, nobody knew who I was because I wasn't part of the family or anything like that. And uh, it was kind of a informal one to where the grandfather stood in front and said, you know, said his piece and said, anybody else wants to come up? So when I was there, I, you know, like I said, she shared a lot of things with me, but she didn't share the bad things that were happening to her. Like, I didn't know that she had an alcohol problem. I didn't mm -hmm. know that she had married a, a guy that was an addict and an alcoholic and all the trauma she was going through. And I was overhearing a lot of the conversations that was going on about her. And they were saying, well, she's no longer in pain. Thank God she kicked the habit. She was on the, on the road for total recovery and stuff like mm -hmm. that. So uh, when I got up there and I started explaining to her, yeah, I used to be her science teacher. We're connected with the story that I'm writing. I am dedicating the book to her. And inside the book, I did put a page in, in memory of her that, uh, oh, that's you know, that kind of just says that she was a, a girl with a disarming smile and just a, a you know, twinkle in her eye. She wasn't the most smartest kid or the best athlete because most of the time, those are the students she always remember. Mm -hmm. But she was just somebody just a little different than, than your everyday kid. And so uh, the father and the, the sisters came at me afterwards. So I went ahead, when the book was published, I went ahead and, and got some copies and gave it to them because, you know, just letting them know that, you know, she still lives inside this story. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's such a sweet story. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's really touching that you can be connected to other people through writing that way and through storytelling. Yes. It tells what a powerful medium it is for connecting it people, is. I think, you know. It truly is. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Is there any other last minute advice you'd like to dispense before we wrap up? Yes. If you read a writer's book, please put a review in there. <laughs> we love reviews. Yes, we do. Give us, give us something to, to see that we're doing something right or something wrong. Right. Right. Definitely. Definitely. So where can uh, people connect with you and find your books? Uh, well, I'm at richardpstoneauthor.com. Uh, slowly putting together my, my website. It's not there. If you want to send me an email, it's richardpstoneauthor at gmail.com. I'm also on Twitter. I'm also on, uh, I got to get my, since marketing is very difficult and very expensive, I make these postcards out and send them out everywhere I can, especially comic book shots, shops. But nice. uh, also on facebook.com slash Dickie Stone, D-I-C-K-I-E Stone. I'm on twitter.com Richard P. Stone one and Instagram.com Richard P. Stone author. Okay. And uh, like I said, I'm soon to be getting my website up and running. And uh, yeah, if you like the book, let me know. Because I mean, the, the, the joy of writing was I got two reviews, one for each book from somebody I didn't even know who they were. And they gave me a five star review on both. And I just, yeah, kind of went, that works. That feels good. That's another one of those golden moments for writers, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Awesome. Well, I will make sure and link all those up in the show notes so that people can come find you. And again, thank you for coming and sharing your story. You shared so many just fun, really colorful uh, little uh, experiences. I really enjoyed it. Uh, pleasure being here. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely.